our webinar on scaling inclusive business. We're going to hear about Ted's framework and Olivier's pathway and a host of insights and top tips and some challenges and explore can we solve the challenges facing inclusive businesses trying to scale. We're going to start in just a minute. People are still logging in and we have a great array of people joining us today. So meanwhile, let me just introduce the organisations behind the event and some other resources and then explain to you the structure of our webinar today. So the webinar is organised by the Practitioner Hub for Inclusive Business in partnership with the William Davidson Institute at the University of Michigan, which is where Ted is from, Eistra Hybrid Strategies Consulting, which is where Olivier is from, and sponsored by the UK Department for International Development, or UK Aid, as you can see. We're on Twitter and uh, online on the webinar page. Now this webinar is part of a series, all focused on the issue of scaling inclusive business. We recently sent out from the Practitioner Hub our November series, which is all about scaling. It's actually in two parts. We had such rich content uh, that you have to bit me address there uh, to the entire series, the, the newsletter, which is full of blogs, all about scaling inclusive business. We also have a know-how page on scale now on the Practitioner Hub in partnership with the William Davidson Institute, a long-term resource on this topic which gets updated regularly. And just last week we launched a new checklist, four-page checklist for entrepreneurs. Have a look, see, am I meeting this, am I meeting that, am I doing what is necessary to scale? A few ideas condensed into four pages. So after the webinar, feel free to look at those. We will be sending you emails after the webinar with links to this webinar and its related slides. Now, I think we have people pretty much logged in. We are going to run for an hour. At the end of the hour, I realize people need to get back to whatever they're doing, but if you have questions that haven't been answered at that point, our two um, presenters are willing to stay on for another 10 to 15 minutes to finish up answering the questions, though I realize a lot of people will leave on the hour. So, let's start our conversation. At any time at all, you can type your questions in chat. Um, we're going to have an introductory discussion. We're going to have a few slides and present presentations from both our experts, uh, some discussion, and then open it to general chat. But type them, your questions in the chat function at any time. Please, after we finish, we will send you a short feedback questionnaire. We do need your feedback. We need to know what's useful. We need to know what to improve. And we need that to get future funding for webinars. So please fill it in. And as I said, join us on Twitter any time. So I am delighted to introduce today Olivia Kayser, who's the founder and CEO of Heistra, and Ted London, who's the Vice President and Senior Research Fellow at the William Davison Institute at the University of Michigan. Both these gents have written books. Let me just show you. It happened to both write books last year on scaling at the base of the pyramid, and we thought it was too much of a coincidence that these two great thinkers and practitioners have both been considering this core issue at the same time. Hence, we're delighted to bring them together today. And I, when I say they're practitioners and thinkers, they really are. They're both actively engaging with companies all the time, but they're both thinking very hard and sharing their thinking, uh, which is why I think today's conversation is going to be so good. And myself, I'm Caroline Ashley. I'm the editor of the Practitioner Hub for Inclusive Business. So we're going to think about scale rather than failure or bumping along at the bottom. We're going to explore what enables a business to scale. We're going to get key insights from both of them based on their books. And then we'll have the discussion, as I said. I want to start off um, asking both of you just your perspective on what are we talking about with scale. Olivier, could you share with us how you see the question of scaling an inclusive business and perhaps with an example of something that either didn't manage to scale or did manage to scale, just to help us set the boundaries of our conversation? Thank you, Caroline. Um, I think scale is really about achieving impact at the scale of the problem and uh, basically addressing a problem at scale, eradicating a problem. And there are many ways of achieving this. Oftentimes it's about uh, affecting or changing government policy. It's about creating a social movement. But in the particular case of today, I think we are addressing the issue of how to address scale with a business model. That could be done through replication or through actually the growth of one individual organization. I think two examples that come to my mind when we talk about scale. A positive story is the one of Gramin Shakti in Bangladesh that addressed the issue of uh, poor lack of electricity 
in rural Bangladesh, about 40% uh, of the population doesn't have access to the grid. And they developed solo, solar home systems in a way that was sustainable, commercially sustainable. And they have reached by themselves about 2 million households. But most interestingly is that their example was followed by competitors. And this is a total 4 million uh, solar home systems uh, that were actually installed in Bangladesh, i.e. around 20 million people or a third of the people in need. This at the scale of Bangladesh, I would say, is scale. At the opposite end of the spectrum, I think one of the most frustrating positive cases I know of is the one of Codensa in, uh, in Colombia, in Bogota, which is an electric utility that has found a very impressive way of providing uh, access to microcredit uh, to poor families, leveraging their assets, which is their list of customers, their invoicing and money collection systems. And they have managed to build a $400 million loan portfolio, providing uh, loans at a much lower cost than microfinance institutions. So it's a fantastic innovation. And one would, would, think, would, one would think that this situation applies in many other countries. Unfortunately, it has been copied by the gas utility in Bogota, but it hasn't spread across the world. And this project has been successful for at least 10 years, and the replication has not taken place. Great, thank you. Maybe we'll come back later then to the question of why that hasn't replicated elsewhere if it's been so successful. Ted, could you share with us your understanding of um, what it is to go to scale and perhaps an example to shed light on that? Yeah, no, thanks, Caroline. And thank you and, and Olivier for allowing me to participate. This, is, this should be a lot of fun. Um, yeah. So scale, yes. when I think about it, is really the reason why we get excited about business being engaged in low-income markets in the base of the pyramid. The, the idea is, you know, when we think about development in general and grants, I think they're terrific, but the question always arises is what happens when the money runs out? And can we go further than the initial investment allows us to do? And both of those are answered by scale, and I think that that's an, a, a crucial role for business to play is, is being sustainable at scale. When I think about scale, it's really the idea that a business is building something internally, the capabilities, the team, mm -hmm. to go from one market to another without having to reinvent everything. So they can go faster, they can go more efficiently from place to place. And that's what scale is in a company. It's being able to take things internally from one place to another. Support. Um, and I think that remains the biggest challenge for us interested in, in low-income markets. It's that we just haven't seen enough scale. You know, we, and that's the promise. Um, and, you know, an example of scale certainly is mobile telephony where you're beginning, you know, if you go back to 2000, so just 16 years ago, less than half of humanity or half of humanity had not made a phone call yet. And now you go out and, and you look in the rural markets and it, even if cell phones aren't ubiquitous, access to cell phones is increasingly ubiquitous. So you're seeing more and more uh, that, that that model has worked. We're seeing some in ag, Olivier's, I know knows a few others that have, but in general, I think too few have really scaled. And that's the big challenge is, you know, I think that's the question we have to ask ourselves is how can we enable more base of the pyramid enterprises to scale? What do we need to do to help them become more likely to scale? And I think that to me remains, the, at, at this time, the number one challenge in this space is really about getting to scale. Great, thank you both. Well, Ted, let's kick off with your few slides, particularly as I'm doing such a bad job of controlling the slides my end. I think you take charge of the screen and share your screen and talk us through a few of the key elements from your book, and then we'll hear a few key elements from Olivier, and then we'll get the discussion going. I'm not sure I'm gonna do any better than you, Caroline, but I'm gonna try. Let's see. Yeah, my mouse doesn't like this. Can you, can you see my screen? Yes. All right, so, you know, I was asked to keep this at about five minutes or so, and I'm happy to, as we go through, if there are questions, I'm happy to dive into more detail across anything I discuss, but I just kind of want to set the table a little bit. Um, and I think, what attracted me, and I suspect that many of the folks on this call, is this BLP promise. The idea that we can create sustainable, scalable enterprises that truly alleviate poverty 
And what made it attractive in many respects and different was it wasn't about business doing it themselves. Because if they could have done it, they would have already done it. And it wasn't about development doing it themselves because if they could have done it, they would have already done it. It was really the idea that how do we bring two sectors that historically have worked separately together in a new and important way. And that's both the opportunity and the challenge that we face. And just sort of setting the, the stage. Oh, that's interesting because now I can't change my slides. Okay, there we go. Hold on. All right, growing momentum. So, you know, when I got involved in this, and, and I guess I first touched base with this in 1989 when I went to Malawi as a Peace Corps volunteer um, after doing my, my business degree and being a, a senior consultant. And I really began to think about what's the role in business addressing social issues. And, and I've been at it now, I guess, almost 30 years. And, and as Caroline mentioned, now I'm at, at the University of Michigan, both on the faculty at the Ross School of Business and vice president of the Scaling Impact Initiative at, at WDI and at the William Davidson Institute. With the real focus, we work a lot in the field with our partner organizations and there are you know, dozens and dozens of leadership teams across different sectors. And, and what I've certainly seen over this time is, is those of you who've been long enough, that the, the conversation has changed. Mm -hmm. If you dial back 10 or 15 years ago, it was often seen, and, and in some respects still is in some quarters, that business was part of the problem. But I think more and more we're seeing business as part of the solution. And, and the question then is, is how do we engage them? And that's moved more from business as a, as a philanthropic partner to business as a, a scaling partner, as someone that we, we want to build business models that work economically. There's growing interest. You know, we, we're seeing more companies and development uh, organizations getting engaged in this, unlocking new resources. Certainly, when I got inv involved with this, I don't think there was such a thing as impact investing. Um, and, and even in the last five or 10 years, you've just seen that taking off. And that has some strengths and certainly limitations as well, but a powerful new resource. And then here at the University of Michigan, I see this, but also out in the field that we're seeing some of the best and brightest people on the planet beginning to think about these issues. So that's the good news. But we've had mi mixed venture success, which isn't so surprising. You know, when you think about launching any business anywhere, whether it's in the UK or France or, or the United States, it's going to be difficult. But I think we've been disappointed in the results so far in low income markets. And I'm going to argue that perhaps there are three things going on here. Uh, one is there are certainly a lot of pilots. Um, there's no doubt about it. But I'm not sure that these have been set up to go to scale in many cases. A lot of times people set up pilots to be pilots. And we haven't seen enough scalable enterprises. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so we need more of our pilots to go to scale. We've had a lot of activity. So we're seeing lots and lots of things happen. But we haven't seen enough of, of what have we learned. We've had successes and failures. But what is it that we've really learned from all this journey over the past 10 or 15 years? What, what are the lessons? Uh, and then similarly, there have been lots of cases and reports but what are the best practices? And, you know, I sit at a business school in the U.S. And, and as a school, we spend a lot of time thinking about how do we make businesses more successful? But we do that in, in the developed world context. And I think we need to apply more of that, not just at business schools, but across the globe and thinking about that in the developing world and particularly not just the developing world, but in the low income markets, the informal economy. What are the best practices? And, and I think what we need is a toolkit that, we can't guarantee success, but we can enhance the likelihood of success. And that's what this, this book I wrote was really about, was beginning to say, what are the tools and strategies and frameworks that managers can use to increase their likelihood of success based on what we've learned over the past 15 years or so? And for me, going all the way back to 1989. Um, and this, this was sort of the, just a quote from the book to give you a sense. We have seen the promise of sustainable, scalable BOP impact enterprises but we have to do more to truly deliver on that promise. We must continue to draw lessons from the experiences, the successes and frustrations of enterprises operating in the field and identify what works and what doesn't. You know, I'm, I get a little bit tired of going to events uh, and I understand why, where everyone tells us how great they're doing. And I think that's interesting. And, and when that happens, if I get the opportunity, I often ask them, maybe not during their session, but afterwards is what have you learned? What were the six, you know, what led you to to where you are and what are the biggest challenges you face. Um, 
I think that's a much more interesting question for us is not, are you successful, but what got you where you are and what do you still need to do to really go to scale? And the way I think about it is, is around this idea of, of standardized tools. That if you think about it in the developed world, we have lots of standardized tools. We've got, you know, Portis by Forces, the four P's of marketing, SWOT analysis, lots of things that, that are standardized at the level of the enterprise, but then can be customized by different enterprises. And you think about the tools I just mentioned, they can be used, you know, if you think about the SWOT analysis or let's or the four or the Portis by Forces. They can be used by any enterprise at any stage of growth it, across different geographies, across different sectors. So we can build standardized tools that can be customized. And we need to do that in low income markets because, you know, frankly, you don't know what you don't know. And part of the benefit of a tool is it allows you to begin to think about the environment, the business opportunity more holistically. You know, if you think if you were left on your own to think about the, the five forces, you might come up with three. Or, or whatever it would be. And this allows you to begin to understand all five and then assess what's important because you're operating with constrained resources. So it begins to allow you to, to think more clearly about how to prioritize. So again, if you have these frameworks, you can understand the full the full opportunity and then strategize about making um, good decisions. So that's what you know I, I built in this framework. And I'm not gonna, this is my last slide and I'm not gonna go through them all uh, in depth, but just talk about each one uh, briefly. One is, and I know these are difficult to see, and again, I can talk more later, but one is uh, what I've seen repeatedly is enterprises set themselves up incorrectly. They have the wrong resources, the wrong metrics. They, have, they struggle with the appropriate questions around problem solving. They don't have the right structure. And what I've seen time and again is if you don't set yourself up right internally at the beginning, the chances of success diminish drastically. You know, and you need to make sure you, what are your metrics of success? What are you really thinking about? How do you learn while also seeking growth? How do you build the right team? How do you get the right financing? What are the problems you need to solve? Who do you need to solve them with? How do you set yourself up internally or as a startup? You know, what is the right uh, um, structure, uh, legal structure to select? So, you know, that's one, how do you set yourself up for success? And then I think that, that you have to really think about planning from scale from the start. And that's really at, at the, how do you co-create at the very beginning to get yourself off and running? How do you make sure your pilots are, are properly geared toward innovation? And then how do you think about embedding and building competitive advantage and creating capabilities that can sustain you in the market and then allow you to scale from place to place? Um, the next would be, you know, how do you understand the value proposition from the perspective of the base of the pyramid? And, and you know, so many enterprises, you know, go with the idea that it's too costly, complicated, or difficult to engage with the base of the pyramid and really understand impacts and poverty alleviation. But in fact, if you worked in the developed world, you'd have to do that. You'd have to have a regular conversation with your customers and understand their perspective of value. We need tools again to help our enterprises do this. And then finally, this is such a difficult environment to operate in. You know, we're talking about operating in an environment that's constrained in terms of infrastructure and institutions and, and legal environment and dealing with and working with consumers and producers that are constrained in terms of their resources. You know, how do we build the right partnership ecosystem? You know, in some respects, that's just levering what's happened in the developed world where there's a lot of investment by government and others to support enterprises, be it you know, now in, in clean energy or, or basic R&D, or certainly in the United States, when we had a, a crisis, we supported the banking industry and, and the car industry. So the idea that, that partners invest, you know, government invests and, and, and others invest in companies is not something unique. It's just a tool that we need to think about more clearly in the developing world. So again, if you begin to think about these four, how do you set yourself up for success internally? What are the unique aspects of scale that you need to think about in low income markets? How do you understand value from the perspective of the base of the pyramid and build a more robust value proposition over time? And how do you create the right set of partners to help you move this forward? So that's what I got. You know, I think that it moves us toward fulfilling the base of the pyramid promise if we start developing strategies, frameworks, and processes that increase the likelihood of enterprise success at scale. So I'm going to stop there. That's sort of the big picture. Happy to dive in more. And I'm going to turn it back over to, to Caroline. Well, thank you, Ted. I think 
I think you've made a very strong case for, for tools, toolkits and so on. What you've also made clear is that it's so such a broad ranging question and it's not at all about just do we have the right price point or do we have the right distribution model? It's such a broad issue. Um, now I'm just trying to share my screen. I'm sure this is going to work. That's not the screen you wanted, is it? Sorry, one second. Can you still see my screen? Yes, it's nice. <laughs> uh, but it's not the PowerPoint. Joy. Perhaps, Olivier, we just move straight over to you. You can take charge of the screen and share your slides because that's I'm what we're going not, to do. Next. I'm not sure I can. Um, as long as you have it. No, it'll just ask you whether you really want to take it from me, and I, you're allowed to say yeah. Um, I'm and really sorry, but I don't see where I can. Down the bottom, it should say share screen, little green. Share screen, now I see it, okay. Uh, and where are my Okay. Oh. This is it, how to scale up. Thank you. Fantastic. Yep. So I, I really love uh, Ted's toolkit and the structure he brings, uh, which is really badly needed because there are so many concepts and ideas floating around. Bringing some order into this chaos is extremely welcome and congratulations for this uh, valiant effort. Um, now I'm going to speak about the experience we, we, we have developed at Histra and on, on how to scale up. And as you see from this picture, uh, this is not a straight road and it's going up. <laughs> So it's going uphill. It's, it's clearly a, a challenge, and we have seen many of our clients go through that. The, the experience we are working, basing these in, uh, insights on, is really working with about 50 clients over the last seven years, range, starting with identifying opportunities to create inclusive business, getting the organization in place, uh, the scale-up and replication strategy, and supporting the implementation. Uh, I would say two-thirds of our work has been done with large corporates, but also foundations, aid agencies, and a number of social enterprises. And on that basis, we have developed, I would say, four key insights uh, that at least were things we have learned, i.e. when we got started, we didn't know them. And uh, are, are a bit, uh, so I don't know whether you guys will find it counterintuitive, but for us, there were clearly things we would have wished to know when we got started. And I'll go into each of these four points. The, the first one is that poor people, what they want is risk-free solutions, not cheap products. That companies need creativity and courage, not generosity. And that partnerships need rigorous governance, not only trust and common purpose. And projects need leaders and best practices, much more than money. Let me go over these four, four points. The, the first one is that the, the key thing people think poor people or low income consumers are people who don't have money and therefore their money, they are poor, therefore you need to give them cheap products. It's an issue of affordability. But this is fundamentally the wrong mindset. When you look at the internal rate of return uh, the, that uh, these poor families get from investing in an improved cook stove or an irrigation pump, a water purifier, a solar lantern or even a solar home system, you see internal rates of returns that are incredibly high. No one in the rich world has in front of him or her in investments that are so lucrative. And this creates a question about what's about the price. Look at solar lanterns. If they were twice as expensive, because you replace the solar lamp, with the solar lamp and you, you replace a kerosene lamp, it, I mean, the return would still be 75%, which will still be extremely high. Which, by the way, explains why these families can take a microfinance loan at a huge interest rate, and still it's a good investment to make. So that's a key point, because on paper, these investments are incredibly profitable. And therefore, price is not an issue. The issue is a risk of the perceived risk of doing of buying something which is new 
that people are not used to. And this is a, a picture from a guy in Bangladesh, actually it's from India, who is uh, looking at uh, this gentleman, the technician who is installing a solar home system on their house. And as you see from the picture, the gentleman is very worried. He just bought himself something which is cost, at that time, cost $250, which he has been told would last for 15 years. And he's extremely worried that this thing is going to work or not. And in the case of Gramin Shakti, the solution they developed was to say, okay, we are going to give you a three years loan, but you are going to pay every month and you are going to pay the technician. So the technician will have to come back every month to make sure your system works. And that was key in getting this farmer to commit to making such a risky investment. Extremely profitable investment, but perceived to be extremely risky. The other guy who was worried was a CFO, Gramin Shakti, who just gave a $250 loan to someone in the middle of nowhere. And, but the CFO suddenly knew he was going to repay his loan, otherwise the technician was not going to come to do the maintenance. So here we see that the issue is really about risk, perception of risk by the poor families, but also the need from the supplier, in that case, the distributor of solar systems, to really understand this perception of risk and find a solution that minimizes the perception of risk. It's a similar situation with CEMEX in Mexico. And I don't know if Israel Moreno or friends from uh, Patrimonio on the webinar, but they had registered. This remains one of my favorite cases where in order to be able uh, to, uh, to sell more cement to poor families in Mexico, uh, CEMEX figured out that they needed to provide a complete holistic solution that provided home delivery, that was not limited to cement, but all the building materials, that provided technical assistance in order to ensure the room that would be built uh, would uh, work, that also froze the prices of building materials over 70 weeks so people knew they could actually deliver. And these 450,000 families who benefited from this program, the big difference for them is that they knew that in 70 weeks, they would get their room built. And this really transformed their lives. Now, in doing so, CEMEX had to become an architect, a financier, a distributor of building materials, all things. And you could imagine the discussion at the board of CEMEX saying, hey, we are manufacturers of cement. We are not distributors. We are not bankers. We are not architects. So uh, clearly, in order to be able to provide this holistic solution, companies needed to get out of their comfort zone and address the complete need of their clients and therefore take the risk of getting out uh, of what they were used to. And that, in doing so, uh, and that's really the point Ted was making, there is a great, great piece of news, is that today the social innovation lab is full, and the, but the globalization plant is empty. Yes, it's empty, but the good news is that the lab is full. So you don't need to reinvent the wheel. And that's one of the greatest mistakes corporates make, is that they think they need to invest to invent everything themselves, when they can actually learn from what has already been done. And here is an example of, um, uh, it's, is it working? Uh, the example of Total, with whom we worked for uh, three, four years, who they understood the role they could play in distributing solar lanterns because they realized that poor families were afraid of this new technology, but that they, they distributed these solar lanterns through their gas stations, putting their brand on the solar lanterns and saying, if you have a problem, you can bring it back to the closest gas station. And that's one of the wonderful things corporates have. They have assets that money cannot buy. The brand of Total, there are 4,500 gas stations in Africa where things that they could leverage at no cost, actually making a profit by selling these solar lanterns. And they were things, assets that not even the Gates Foundation could have afforded. That's what makes it interesting. And so companies need this creativity and this courage, not the generosity. In some cases, you need to work through partnerships. 
And we have worked with a number of companies trying to build these multi-level partnerships and, or multi-sectorial partnerships. And typically, it's made out of a lot of generality. Let's break down silos. Let's work together to a common purpose. But most of them have to go through major restructuring because it's not because it is a partnership for development that you don't need to have rigorous governance, rigorous decision-making uh, procedures. Um, and, and that is really something we have seen a lot of naivety in setting up these alliances, which should be addressed as rigorously as business joint ventures. And to finish up, the key point is that when you look at all these projects, and there are many of them, and you see lots of this money that is available through impact investors and others. What we really see today is that the bottleneck are leaders, such as the one who are listening to us today and should be the ones speaking, I guess, um, but also best practices, because we see enormous amount of reinventing the wheel. So I think today the bottleneck for us is entrepreneurs that are well informed about what are the best practices in the world. And with this, I'm done. Thank you. Great, thank you. So, you've both mentioned several things that um, some, some are similar and some are not. I don't know if I'm going to be able to share that, uh, that slides again. Are you able to see my slides now? We see your, your desktop. <laughs> Okay, one second. Looks good. Can you see the slides now? Oh, excellent, okay. So some things you mentioned are quite similar, some are quite different. You've both talked about partnerships, so I'm going to come to that in a second. But first, Olivier, you were saying that about corporates, you're saying basically Corporates have to change their mindset. I really identify with that. I was with a European corporate in East Africa last week who really wants to get to scale in the low-income market, and they're a product company, and realizing just how far they have to go from being a product company. So they're not cement, but I completely get what you're saying. But are you saying, and Ted, we could get your comment on this, that corporates are necessary to get to scale, or corporates are the best way to get to scale can we get scale without corporates? Can you just share your thinking on that? Um, when, when you look at uh, venture capital firms and the exit strategies of venture capital firms, in about 90% of the cases, the startups are sold to a large corporate. Right? And I would say they go to IPO typically when no one wants to buy them. Because if there is a corporate who has the distribution network, has the brands, has the, the, the footprint, that allows to accelerate the scale up of this particular venture, it makes much more sense to sell it than try to do it alone. I would say the, logic, the same logic applies for inclusive business or social business. It's not a general rule, but when you need, such as in the case of solar lanterns, when you need to reassure customers and you need to have a quick distribution channel throughout Africa, not using Total would be crazy. In the case of Total, Total didn't buy the makers of solar lanterns, right? A contractual arrangement could be found, but trying to do it alone would have been crazy. So I would say each social entrepreneur needs to think about what are the assets they would need to accelerate the scale up of their enterprise, who controls these assets, and can they strike a commercial deal or do they need to sell themselves to this enterprise? Okay, so it doesn't mean it has to be done completely by a corporate, but you need to either partner with a corporate or be bought out by them if you're really going to hit It depends, like most things. Okay, thank you. Well, Ted, that resonates with what you're saying about partnerships, because what I really liked was one of the things you said is, I'm sort of paraphrasing, but it's not how many partnerships you've got, it's whether you've got the right ones in place. Could you, so I'm putting words into your mouth, but would you like to explain Explain your perception on partnerships and how they relate to the ecosystem. Sure, sure. Um, and I really enjoyed Olivier's uh, presentation. I should note, and I think he's he's spot on with his assessment about you know really thinking about risk and 
making sure you build a holistic solution, carefully developing the right governance, and then thinking about you know mixing good entrepreneurs with best practices. I think those are all extraordinarily important as we move forward. So I enjoyed that. Thank you, Olivier. Thank you. Coming and from you. Answer your question, Caroline. You know, I, I think that kind of building a little bit on what Olivier says says is it's not partnerships as usual. And we tend to think about, you know, the question that, that seems to come out a lot is often who should we partner with? And while that seems like a good question, it's it's probably not the right one. Um, the right one is probably how do we build the right partnership ecosystem? How do we begin to think, and I think Olivier is touching on this, how do we begin to think about the full set of partners that we need? And of course, these can vary depending on, on whether you're part of a large, uh, you know, corporate, uh, multinational, you know, sort of like, or, you know, um, a large uh, local firm like Semex, you know, as, as Olivia highlighted, what's really interesting is that they really struggled to build a viable solution in Mexico. And they're a Mexican MNC. And we've worked with them like Olivier for years and years. Um, and, the, and the real challenge in a lot of these organizations is you know, th there's um, an old African saying, right? If, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And it's, people seem to want to go fast without really thinking about how to do it well. And, uh, you know, there are, there, it's such a challenging environment that, that you really have to think about the right set of partners. One of them, one of them can be providing financing and technical assistance. And Olivier has mentioned another one is how do we access platforms, be it Total, be it, you know, self-help groups, then how do we really understand the context if we're not local? So how do we enter and gain knowledge? How do we understand a value proposition? How do we begin, you know, and some of the things that, that, that Olivier talked about, you know, solar lanterns and clean water, you need to create market awareness. How do you begin to, to, to drive some consumer behavior. And part of it is making it risk-free and part of it is actually articulating a robust value proposition. And then how do you begin to think about the, the overall environment, the, um, the institutional environment, the legal environment? So what, what I've tried to do is, is sort of that idea of a, a standardized framework is to look across four different areas, sort of a two by two. And I'm a strategy PhD and a strategy professor. So we tend to think about things in, in it's overly simplistic, but in a two by two. And if, if you begin to think about that, you know, what do we need to build the enterprise and what do we need to build the markets around them? How do we enable action and how do we build capabilities? You begin to think about four quadrants and then you say, okay, look, what am I good at? What am I not? So where do I need partners? Then you begin to say, okay, what partners do I already have? What's missing? And if you go at it one at a time, you know, who's the right partner, you address things one at a time. And what you really need to do is build a holistic solution. As, as Olivier has highlighted, you need to think about a variety of different things at the same time. And if you can't do it, or you, you know, and if you can't do it, you need partners. And if it's, if it's unaffordable for you to do it at scale, you need partners as well. And I think this gets to Olivier's point where a lot of things can be done at pilot uh, with, you know, by yourself because you're investing a lot of time and energy to demonstrate the success of a pilot but that cost model doesn't scale. So how do we think about the right partnerships? So you are saying you start with a bit of a capability analysis and an ecosystem and anal gap analysis on where there are gaps and capability of the ecosystem. That's where you prioritize your partners. Your exactly. Partners. First, you've got to have a, a way to think about those capabilities. And again, that, that sort of is the two by two to begin to think about both how do we build the enterprise? And in a lot of cases, how do we build the markets around the enterprises? You know, this, you know, as Olivier has highlighted, there's so much needed for behavior change. And that has to happen to get someone to adopt, um, you know, a, a solar system requires them to make a leap of faith that this thing's going to work. But first, they even have to hear about it and understand it. And I think those are all costly to do as a company. That sounds really obvious. Olivier, I just want to see if you disagree with anything, because to... This way, or maybe have a slightly different angle. Two things. In your slides, you're implying something a little bit blunt about partnerships. I.e., they don't always work because people get them wrong. I don't know if you want to add anything on that. And also in your book, you say these enterprises that you're talking about are ones that have managed to navigate around the constraints in the ecosystem. They didn't uh, I think, wait. I think there, are probably, there are probably two, two, two things that I'd like to say. The, the first one is that we need to separate very much I would say the prototyping pilot stage from the scale-up stage. 
in so the co-creation, the so-called co-creation co stage, uh, which is about creation, about inventing something new, partnership between uh, the business sector and the social enterprises or NGOs can be fantastically helpful in accelerating the learning process. And there, you need a true trust-based alliance. You need to, see, because you cannot write a contract, you cannot get the lawyers in because you don't know what you are going to do together. So it's, you need to have joining forces with a common purpose, trying to come up with the right uh, model that would work. Uh, and typically, you would choose where to do it in the village or in the city where you have found a good NGO to work with. That's how an NGO which has the capabilities and has the willingness to work with you. Now, once you have, once the model works and you are thinking about scaling up, uh, I think if you end up with a strategy that requires, that depends on finding in each village, in each city, in each country, a good partner who has the capabilities and is willing to work with you, then I would argue you have not found a good scale-up strategy. Mm. Uh, I'll give you one example of a, a company who was making water filters. They found, they figured out that working th with MFIs could be a great solution. Uh, but in, and they were working in India. And about 30, 35% of uh, the target market was served through MFIs. And about one in 10 of the partnership they built with MFIs worked. Mm -hmm. So if it's one of the 10 out of 35, it's 3.5% of the market which is addressed. What, ha what happens with the 96.5%? So if you design a strategy which is dependent on partnerships, uh, the problem is you won't have the right partners everywhere. And so what do you do? So if you are forced, and that's, if that's the only strategy that works, fine, but I would say this shouldn't be an objective in itself. We should try to avoid partnership as much as possible. That's my, my view. Ted, do you want to respond to that? We should avoid partnership as much as possible. I love it. This is great. This is fun. So, um, so I, would, I think we come from a different perspective, and I completely agree that, that partnerships are complicated. But the, the, I would argue the example Olivier gave of you know, successfully scaling with a, with a, or successfully demonstrating success in a small village with a nonprofit. That to me is a failed pilot because if it's not scalable, why are you doing it? What you want to be doing in your pilots as Olivier highlighted is testing what can go to scale. So if you, know, if you have to find a local NGO and, and dive in every place, and that's not a viable business model. But you know, there are big nonprofit organizations that are global that you can work with. You, know, you mentioned you know, uh, Grameen. You know, there, there's CARE, there's Oxfam, there's lots of bigger organizations. So if you begin to think about that model, you know, you can scale and scale can be, you know, within a country where you have one, one or two deep partnerships with big organ, you know, big nonprofits across a country. And then you begin to look to replicate that model from country to country. Um, you know, we've seen organizations work with the World Food Program and go country to country doing it. So I think, I think it's, it's possible. And I think the, the big challenge here where I might push back a little bit is if you if you haven't built a good partnership strategy then you haven't dedicated enough effort to it you know something I call I think every enterprise needs someone along the lines of a chief ecosystem director mm -hmm. somebody that is really deep and understands this other sector if you will from the company side the nonprofit the development sector and understands how to build those partnerships and build the right ecosystem. And if you haven't invested in someone doing that, the chances of having a successful partnership are low. And if you don't have a set of successful partnerships, the chances of going to scale are low. Um, there's always a few, but if you have to do it all yourself, it is so, so expensive that it just changes the cost dynamics in such a way that it's not possible. So I think, I don't disagree with Olivier's point, but I think the difference might be that I think you have to commit to a strategy of doing this and build the capabilities internally to do it well. And I think if you can do it well, then you have a chance of being successful. And I don't know what the right success rate is. You know, in the U.S., I forget what it, exactly what it is. You know, if, if you run, um, you know, 100 businesses, you know, how many are left after five years? And we can all talk about that. But, you know, this also begs to something else that, that I, I want to just mention is the thing we're not very good at yet is investing in a learning agenda. 
we love to invest in enterprises, um, but we don't invest in understanding what drives success. And until we as a community do more of that, we're going to continue to struggle and not be sure and not really understand success. And if I was to say anything, and this maybe applies more to the development community than the enterprise leaders out there, because I know as an enterprise, you're focused on the problems of, of today. But I think as a development community and the academic community, we have to think about the, the domain of tomorrow. And we need to build a learning agenda into this. And I know that's a big part of the, the practitioner hub. I think those are the kind of things we need where we begin to aggregate our experiences and push those boundaries. And if we don't do that, we're always going to be, as, as, as I think both you, Caroline, and you, Olivia, has mentioned, is, is we're going to continue to reinvent the wheel because um, yeah. we haven't shared best practices. I think that's one area we, we all agree. We've actually had a question on that. But I just want to finish on partnerships because we had a question on the chat. Um, I mean, I think you're certainly both saying we need different partnerships at, at different stages, according to whether we're trying to pilot or really go to scale, but with Olivier giving much more caution about partnerships for the actual scaling approach. But the question we had was about the need for partnerships in the pre-competitive space mm. uh, among various countries along the value chain uh, to transfer, transform a whole sector. Do any of you have any comments on the importance of the pre-competitive space partnerships for sector transformation? Do you, Olivia, do you think those are important, even though you're saying once you're reaching scale, be careful? De definitely, definitely. I mean, pre-competitive is really a stage where you don't know what you are doing, right? where, where you, you don't know what the solution will be. And so you don't really know which partners you will need and whether they will be friends or rivals or... So you need somehow uh, a desire, a, a group of people who think they have more to learn, to win by collaboration uh, than to lose and uh, that, that you could keep the lawyers outside of the room for a while because you, uh, there is, I mean, the, the, the question of the share of the pie it doesn't matter. What you want is first to grow a pie and then once the pie exists, we'll argue about it, uh, about our share. Um, and definitely in, in, in work we have done in setting up the Toilet Board Coalition with a number of players, both from the private and public sector, this was key because what we, we found opportunities for collaboration that no one had anticipated at the creation of the coalition. And, and they emerged because of the mindset of the people, of the goodwill of the people who were there, uh, and because... Uh, uh, there, there was this desire uh, to do things together. And at some point, uh, people started arguing, but this was good news. Uh, there was something to fight for. Mm. Okay. We're getting a lot of good questions in, so I'm going to get through some of them with, and ask you for relatively quick answers on them. I think there's an important framing one um, from Hernandez, which is how is this approach of doing business different from what's done in a business as usual context? So what's the difference between business addressing the market of poor people and, and the business addressing market? Yeah. Yeah, addressing poor people or social impact versus business as usual. And Ted, I think this comes to some of your framing. So would you like to tackle that one first? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a great question. Um, and, and it isn't that we're reinventing business. We still have to build sustainable, scalable enterprises that create competitive advantages, that build viable capabilities. The challenge is recognizing the unique aspects of doing that in low income markets. You know, and, and you know, when we think about um, starting, for example, an enterprise, we often think about this as you know, very much aligned to, to technology R&D where you're beginning, and I think Olivier has highlighted some of this, but you're, instead of thinking about technology R&D, you begin to think about business model R&D. Yes. Right? Well, how do you build the right business model for this context? What's the right talent? And you can imagine the talent would be different from business as usual, um, you know, going to scale, what is competitive advantage in a low income market where you have limited institutions? What are the capabilities you really need to focus on building in this market? So it's, it's the principles within these that change in the markets, the big framing. This isn't capitalism, you know, 4.0. This is saying, you know, and we could debate whether we think capitalism is good or bad, but the question is that's the system we have now. So what can we do given that system? And how do we develop the right tools and frameworks and strategies that leverage the existing business ideas like competitive advantage or effective piloting and apply them in this context? So I think it's a great question. 
And the real challenge is, is the environment in which these enterprises are trying to operate in and the, the consumer base or the produ producers they're trying to serve. Olivia, do you want to add to that? Um, yes, please. Um, I think the, 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 big, the big difference comes from the fact that here we are not talking only about business, we are talking about large corporations. And, and the large corporation, I mean, why are they interesting is because they have the assets, they have the brands, they have the distribution networks, they have the technology, they have the relationships that, that could accelerate dramatically the scale up of a given innovation. But with this, it's like, a, I, I, it's a bit like the ivy that grows on trees. I mean, IVs can save a lot of time by growing on a tree if they want to reach the, the sky, right? But the problem is that if you are a tree, if you are big, that means you are old. And if you are old, that means you are rigid and set in your ways. So with the potential for scale always also comes the rigidity and the stability. And so that's a bit the, the, the problem I see most often. And, and say they tend to be incredibly self-centered. Um, so one important thing is to get them to not to focus on themselves, but to, to focus on the problem they want to solve. Step one. And second, look at what already exists out there. What are the social innovations that have already to proven to work at some scale that they can learn from? And then, but only then, think about what role could I play in accelerating the scale up of these innovations? In most cases, we see companies starting from a blank sheet of paper saying, yes, I'm smarter and more powerful than anyone, so I'm going to crack the problem on my own. And this really never works. So I think one big difference uh, uh, between the traditional way of, for, for large corporates to think about business or not, in that case, it needs to be problem-centric, not company-centric. Second, it needs to be humble, not based on their own strength, but based on what exists out there and why is it working. And then uh, have the willingness to take the risk to go outside of your uh, comfort zone. I, I remember talking to a big consumer good company who, I, I, in the end, I mean, the bottom line is they wanted to save the world provided it could be sold in a box. And if it, if it was, and when I said, yeah, but these guys need services. Yeah, but we don't do services. I said, but yeah, but could, could we? No, no, but we don't do services. The CEO said, no. Yeah, but I mean, that's what your customers need. Yeah, no, no, but no. And there was no way to get this on the, on ta on the table just because this was something they were not comfortable with. And that's something large corporates have a tremendous difficulty because through the, the years of history, they, they have been burned before. They have tried things which didn't work. And they have learned how to, to focus very narrowly. And, and, the, and the McKinsey consultants, I've been one for 18 years, have told them, you know, stick to your knitting. Just do what you are good at. This is your core business. Outsource everything else. And in this particular challenge uh, or, or business opportunities, you need to take this holistic approach because you cannot assume someone else will be there to do the distribution, to do the financing, to do the after sales service. You need to take, do it all. And that's the big, biggest difference I see, is the need to broaden their definition of their, what their business is. Okay. I, I don't want to stay on corporates all the time, because I know we have a mixed audience. But we, just to finish on this corporate issue, um, we hear a lot about Semex, and we hear a lot about you know, various other examples in, I don't know, microfinance or solar or... And there's a lot of corporates out there in these markets that don't hear about these models and they all meet in their room and they have their business unit strategy meetings and they are in their own box. And people have been asking you, how do we get lessons shared? How do we get donors to take these lessons into account? How do we get entrepreneurs? So how do we actually reach into corporates that are thinking inside their own box and only inside their own team to even contemplate this mindset? Does it rely on them happening to commission some McKinsey consultants who happen to have broader experience and link them to other hybrid ways of thinking? We need a few businesses to be successful. Okay. I think I, think I, I fully agree with, with Ted that there are much too many pilots. I think our common friends, too hard, talks about pilotitis. Or pilot, there are too many pilots going on. Well, we need a few 
undisputed business successes, and this will carry the attention of everybody. So I would say we don't need more breadth, we don't need more people interested. If they are not interested today, please stay uninterested. Don't, don't add to the crowd of bad projects, please stay, stay at home. But we need a few ones that are going to be successful. If that happens, we need the new unicorns, we need the unicorns of inclusive business. Mm -hmm. Okay, so to I'll, I'll add just one comment to that, um, which I think is beautiful, is if you're going to do it, do it well. Yeah. I think all I think, you know, we've seen this, I've worked with, like Olivia, many companies, and again, it gets back to, you know, this idea of best practices. Set yourself up for success. It's difficult to do something different in a large existing organization because those corporate antibodies come after you. Uh, and they want you to look as much as possible like everything else that's going on. So make sure, you know, you've got the right talent, you have the right metrics, you're solving the right problems, you've got the right structure. And, and then you give yourself a chance. And I think, Caroline, part of it is finding someone who's willing to take a risk and then giving them the tools they need to do something. And that's how a lot of these changes happen. Or you see a CEO or a leader saying, look, I could really do something unique and different during my time running this company. Let's explore this as an opportunity. But again, it's not just doing it, do it well. So I, I agree with Olivia, if you're not gonna try and do this well, if it's just a pet project that you're just hoping to sell, you know, 10,000 or 100,000, don't do it. Start thinking this could be a driver of a new business opportunity, and it's gonna take time to, to, to move to fruition, and I need to set up metrics to show that we're on target for growth. A lot like you do with R&D. It's not about generating a profit, the, the day you, you think about a new technology, you create a model that allows you to create options to invest in things that are working, to stop things that don't, and give yourself the appropriate time frame with the appropriate potential return to pull this off. If you start setting yourself up correctly, then you have a good chance of being successful, or at least a better chance. Let me be careful about saying, like any enterprise, there's gonna be successes and failures, or any new initiative, regardless of the type of organization. And just to transition to you, to what you're going to, Carolyn, this applies to, to both um, startups as well and social entrepreneurs. They sometimes chase after money and adopt metrics that almost surely mean they're going to fail because they have to generate some sort of an immediate return, which mm -hmm. short term, you know, curtails any piloting. If they fail to develop the right partnerships, they're trying to generate revenues in six months, you know, without the appropriate learning model. And it gets back to, you know, this idea of co-creation, all the things we've talked about. It just takes some time and a learning agenda. And if you don't build that in, you may go fast, but you're not going to go far. So let, let me push you on those, Ted, with some questions that people have come in. Um, particularly, Olivia, you said that access to finance isn't the key thing. Uh, Rue, Rue is asking, do you think access to finance, even impact investment, is easy enough for small-scale impact projects to support their scaling? So, you know, is it that it's not enough? finance or is it what you just said Ted that they're, they're trying to deal with the finance and, and not with the learning and um, someone else just asked what the metrics for success look like Ted you're saying you have to set your metrics early but what does that mean what do those metrics look like Ted can you comment briefly first and then Olivier and then we'll uh, try and get a couple more questions in before we finish I'm not sure I heard everything but um, so and this is not to be uh, contrite but you know I, I do talk a lot more about this in my book but I do want and again I you know Olivia and I write books not because we, we want to sell a lot of books, it's we want to share knowledge and ideas and, and put ideas out there for further discussion. And yeah, I mean, you begin to think about, um, you know, metrics could be, you know, depending on what it is, it, it could be, you know, uh, number of distributors reached, number of partnerships built, you know, t turnover per distributor. So not profits, but metrics of success. Um, you know, capabilities being developed. So you can begin to think about it with the idea of having short-term maybe learning and longer-term economic metrics uh, and impact metrics. And of course, we haven't really dived, dove into social side of things, but that to me is, is how you create value is, is you, you, you know, in one sense, you alleviate poverty, which is a source of value creation. And by doing that, you build a robust model. And your first question was on the role of MFIs. I mean, Financing is important, but if, if you think that's all you need, then I think you're, you're, and I think Olivier's highlighted this very nicely, then you're sadly mistaken. There are so many other things that you're going to need to build a successful enterprise. It's getting the right financial partner at the right time with the right approach to what you want to do. And if you don't line up well, 
you, you may be better off holding off and getting the financing until you get the right partner. Because again, it's not about going fast, it's about going far. Um, and you have to find the right partners to help you on that journey. Uh, let me just interrupt to say, um, some people, we've already hit the hour, some people I know you need to drop off. Um, we need to follow up with the feedback survey that you'll get in about half an hour or so, and we'll send you the links to the slides and to the recording and to the materials. Uh, there are several questions still left, um, so if we're able to carry on for the 10 minutes or so, we'll go through these questions. And then the last question of the is going to be the, um, I think it was a Colombian company you mentioned at the beginning, why didn't that scale, which indeed someone else has asked in the, the channel. Um, We've had lots of questions on partnerships. Some have talked about the need to partner with public organizations. Oh, may sorry. I just provide a, a quick point of view on the impact investing and the, the, the availability of finance for projects. Yeah. My view is that, um, I mean, external financing from grants or loans or whatever never comes for free. Right? And what you have to pay for are milestones, quantitative objectives that are too short term for your organization. Right? So, uh, and typically, uh, the, the time frame of a donor of an investor is something like three years. They want to see results, as they say, numbers in three years' time. And oftentimes, this is too early. And so what, when we did our research on marketing for the BOP, and there is a report that is an open source that you can find on our website, we saw a direct inverse correlation between the money invested in uh, awareness building campaigns or education campaigns and commercial success. Not, which is the fact that was in inverse correlation was kind of surprising. You, you could have assumed it was neutral. It, did, it was not helpful. No, the more you did advertise, the less successful you were. Why? It's because the people who received the money, who had the money to do these marketing campaigns or these education or awareness building campaigns, were focused on growing their customer base. They were not focused on satisfying their customers and playing, having the word of mouth place for them. So if there is one metric I would single out out of everything, it would be the net promoter score. It would be asking our customers, would you recommend this product or service to someone else? Because if you satisfy these guys, first, you are doing what you are paid for, which is, and second, you are creating a marketing machine, which is very cheap, but is slow. I mean, the, the beauty of word of mouth is that it is for free, but the, the negative thing is that it's exponential, i.e., it's very slow in the early years until it picks up. So you need to be very patient. Uh, and everybody who we have seen who has a lot of money is in a hurry because they are in a hurry to demonstrate results and therefore they end up doing the wrong thing. Interesting. You pick up on something that Flory Jacobs said, which is also about you can't capture scaling in donor-funded projects because they have such a short-term horizon. Exactly. You're, you're really presenting a catch-22. If you've got donor money, uh, you can get through the non-commercial period uh, with, on donor money, but you still have to deliver short-term to satisfy the donor. If you don't have donor money, your, your bank balance isn't going to last you very long, and you've got to seek profit. So you also can't invest in the, the slow burn word of mouth. But, uh, so yeah. therefore, you need to have a, a, a small, a low burn rate in the early years. If you start spending too much, uh, then you are caught in the vicious cycle where you need to raise money, therefore you have milestone, and you end up trapped into this negative cycle. All the ones we have seen successful manage to have extremely low burn rate uh, in the early years. Therefore, they had the independence to do the right thing. So low burn rate for your money and maintain your independence and go slowly until you're ready to really... Not slowly to be slow. But don't try to push the market or buy your way into the growth. This will always uh, uh, be a boomerang negative effect. Yeah, so okay. I just, and I'm going to just compliment that by saying, I mean, I, we talk a lot about fast experimentation. You got to learn fast. You got to set up good experiments, learn quickly. And I think it also gets to the point of the donors and others that want to support these, that they need to really look at their own metrics and understand what it is that, that they're trying to drive. So if there, there are folks there, in the donor community, to me, 
the most important metric that you should be looking at, you know, if you're going to support businesses, isn't how much money or how much revenue it's after you've spent the money, how many successful businesses are left? You know, what have you actually enabled? And it's not about how much you spent. It's about, you know, and I think there should be some metrics tied to these investments that are really based on business success, not on, as you said, the short term, because we, you know, the metrics force us into short, short term thinking. That's a challenge for companies, but it's also a challenge for supporters of companies. Mm. Really, say, if we're going to do this, we need to make sure the metrics for our money are actually aligned to maximize business success and the things we want to do. And I know it runs afoul of, you know, the, the need for donors to report back to their own stakeholders. But we need, you know, this is part of the whole process of building a community is making sure all the pieces fit together. And, and again, that requires th this stepping back and not worrying about today all the time and thinking about the big picture of tomorrow. And, and how do we enable the supporting organizations to maximize the impact from their money? And I'm not sure they're doing it right now. Ted, Molly Goodwin already asked on that. How do we encourage donors to do that? To take this different mindset. Well, I think it, it gets to them looking carefully at what they're measured on. What is success for a donor? And if you're, if you're supporting an enterprise and your metrics don't include enterprise success, then you have to wonder if you've really got the right metrics. And that requires people at senior levels to really think about what it is that they want to measure themselves against. And I, this creates a problem, of course, because you're now moving into metrics that you cannot necessarily control by what you do. Exactly. Sense if you do a lot of effort, you know, you can run a lot of training programs or as Olivier say, run a lot of uh, awareness activities. But if it's not linked to enterprise success, then that's not money well spent. So I think there has to be a hard look and saying, if we're going to support this, here are the metrics that we really need to think about doing. And again, when I use the term metrics, I, we could talk about a lot, but what we don't yet know is exactly what those are. We can begin to think about enterprise revenues or profitability or things like that. But again, some deep thought into this, some investment into this kind of thing will really help make sure that we are making the right investments and we need the right set of investments because it's not just money. And the idea that we invest more in impact investing, I think that's a great thing. But in and of itself, it's not enough. What are the other pieces of the puzzle that these enterprises need to be successful? And taking more of, and I think Olivier has used the term, you know, a systemic or beyond the silo approach, this applies to the donor community too. How do we aggregate all these up into a successful strategy for enterprises? I think we can have another webinar on uh, the issue of metrics for success, because my worry is if you are judged entirely on how many enterprises succeed, you won't take any risks and be willing to tolerate those that fail, which I know you would also disagree with. But then I'll have to wait for another day. On a very specific point about these earlier stage enterprises, uh, someone's asked if you can recommend any particular facilities or platforms for financial business or technical support for these ventures that want to scale or want to have the mindset of scaling from the outset. Do you have any suggestions? Any yeah, I, my suggestion would be a learner first. You know, there's there's a couple of books mentioned in this this webinar. I think that'd be great. There's, you know, Caroline, your practitioner hub. The Davidson Institute leads, you know, the next billion. There's actually a fair amount of resources out there to begin to understand what's going on and use those to, to develop your model and to, and to sort of, I think this gets to Olivier's point, you know, to, to assume that nothing's been learned and to start with sort of a blank slate and, and you, you don't reinvent the wheel and don't make the classic mistakes. So be an educated entrepreneur or business leader. Go out dive in, really understand not just the exciting technology, but the whole idea of the business model you need to wrap around this or the exciting service. What's the business model? And that's been the biggest challenge. It hasn't been that we don't lack, you know, um, ideas for, for distributed energy or solar or, or any number of things, clean water. It's building the right model and thinking about all the pieces that Olivier was talking about, making sure that you're developing a holistic solution. Do that first. And, and as you identify these, you look at books or websites, they will cite other things that you might find interesting. And you need to become, you know, it, when we think about teaching people in, in a business school, we give them a set of skills to be successful at a business school to run a business. You know, you need to think about building a set of skills that will allow you to be successful in running a business in the base of the pyramid market. Olivia, do you want to add on that? Yeah, I, I, I think, I think a big difference, you know, I, again, I was a, a strategy consultant for during 18 years with, with McKinsey 
I was a senior partner there. And I really thought, I really think I discovered, I learned what strategy was about when I joined Ashoka after these 18 years with McKinsey. In, in the sense that the thinking like a social entrepreneur means not putting yourself in the center, but looking at how the system works. And by system, I mean the customers, the distributors, the manufacturers, the government, the, understanding how the system works and what is the strategy you could use in order to trigger a change in this system. Uh, and maybe realize that your best way of affecting, of transforming the system is by convincing this particular guy to change this particular behavior. Right. So uh, it's not thinking about scale is not uh, opening your Excel worksheet and putting together a business plan with assumptions. It's understanding how does the system, the ecosystem, which Ted mentions, uh, works and what is the best strategy to transform it to catalytically. Uh, and maybe there is a role for you, maybe there is not. And I think this, this uh, making sure that what comes first is solving the problem, not growing your organization, is the most critical thing to achieving scale. There's several points in, in both your books that I've already been using, but um, again, in this workshop a couple of weeks ago, I took the point from your book where you said, a company who has a mission to be the best company might or might not achieve it. The company that has a mission to solve a problem and be part of that solution is more effective. And I think that, that's what you're saying. It's about focusing on what the problem is you're trying to solve. Yeah. And suddenly you have many friends because no one wants to help you be, be the best company. Exactly. But help you achieve this, solve this problem? Yes. Yeah. And it's good to have friends. Yeah, that's a really nice example. Um, so someone has asked for more recommendations on reading and I think you've already mentioned some and we'll follow up in the, the post-webinar email. I just want to loop back to the question of partnership because the conversation you two had sparked several questions, which I, I don't feel to address them all. Um, someone has asked about um, needing to partner with the public sector and how easy or difficult is that. And then also the um, Aurelian asked about corporates have to partner with social organisations. They're already a little bit inflexible, they're the tree. And that just adds another layer of bureaucracy. And does that just create a, a model that's too inflexible? So let's hear a bit more about how feasible you think it is to partner with public organizations or with big companies partnering with big NGOs. You'd like to go first. I mean, a very quick one. I think sometimes the word partnership is overused. When, when Delight sells uh, Solonance and through Total, this is not a partnership. This is a commercial arrangement, such as when Unilever sells a shampoo through Walmart. You are not, it's not the partnership, right? So let's not overextend the definition of. So when you work with, when you sell your products to the World Food Program, this is not a partnership. This is institutional sales. So let, let's not overdo, overstretch the word partnership. And I think it would be more helpful to limit it to the places where we really. You have a common goal and you don't know where you are going and you try to invent together. This is for me a true partnership. It's more than a contract. I would offer a, a, a compliment to that, which would be you need to make sure you're asking the right question. It's not should we or shouldn't we partner. It's how can we partner effectively. And every time you add a partner, you bring assets and you bring liabilities. Um, and what you need to understand is not, you know, is it, you know, uh, more complicated to add this person or to work the public sector. You've got to understand the, what you're getting into and whether that works for you. And again, if you don't have the skills on your team to fairly quickly look and say, okay, if I engage with this public sector organization, here's what they can bring me and here's what, you know, the challenges they bring with them, then you're, then it is just a guessing game. And, you know, you need to commit to building partnerships and to commit to having the skills on the team to do it well. And it's not, should I do it, but how can I do it well? And there isn't an answer about is public good or bad. There are, you know, like, like there are lots of different types of public partnership, potential public partnerships. And again, I agree with, with um, Olivier, this isn't about, you know, you know, PPPs per se or filling uh, procurement orders. It's about building enterprises. And there's lots of different social organizations you could work for. You know, when we say 
the NGL, that's an incredibly diverse field, both in terms of the problems they're addressing and how they go about doing it. And you need to really understand how these organizations operate, just like we say with business. You know, do you want to have an alliance or a business alliance? It's, it's not that simple. It's how do we find the right partners in business? Same applies here, and how do we do it well? And we need to make again make sure we're asking the right questions, not being saying, "Oh, it's public sector; they're too complicated to work with." We'll step away. No, it's you know, what is the right public organization I need to work for, or who are the right people within these organizations that can make things happen for me? And as Chef Ernest mentions in the field of water. You cannot not work with the public sector. You cannot not work with the government. So uh, let's not make it a general rule. In some cases, partnerships are absolutely necessary. In some of the cases, uh, they, are, they are not useful or not needed. So, uh, but when you do it, you need to recognize that it's going to be very complex. And the only thing I would add is that, I mean, it's not like just having a, a book on how to do it. These are individuals, people who have managed to build over the years the personal relationships within government, within, with the NGOs, and therefore there is this human dimension, people that they can trust. And these, these individuals are very rare. The ones I call the bilinguals or trilinguals sometimes, the ones who can speak government, who can speak NGO, who can speak business, and be co uh, uh, comfortable in these three different cultures are very, very rare. And they are usually the bottleneck to most of these projects success being successful. I, I love that statement. Olivia and I think, because I use the exact same term for the exact same thing. And the question I would ask is, how do you get one of those on your team? If you're going to do this, right? You need to bring someone like that onto your team to be successful and partner. So I, and I love that because we use the bilingual and trilingual in exactly the same way. Okay. So, Olivier, would you like to tell us why that Colombian example didn't scale? And then I'm going to finally ask you both, what I really like, um, and I think other people like, is you say what not to do, as well as what to do. So we're going to finally wrap on a, a couple of things not to do. But first, your Colombian example. I think it was, it was Colombian, yes, and it went to scale there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, in, in Bogota, it, it worked very well. Interestingly, as I, as I said, the model was copied by the gas utility in Bogota, and it was also successful. So, uh, I mean, when you, I think there are a couple of, of angles to it. Uh, the first one is that uh, this is a heavily regulated industry, uh, the utilities. And so, because you get a monopoly, because you are the utility, you are usually by law or regulations, not allowed to leverage your infrastructure into do commercial activities. So you are not in most places a utility, is not allowed to sell something else than electricity. So you could have regulations in place. Now, I think you should be able, hopefully, to lobby and challenge this stupid regulation, because if it's good for the people, you are not, you are not taking advantage of anyone by doing this. You are just offering a smarter solution to have access to microfinance. I think this is one. The second thing is that monopolies, be it private or public, are not renowned to be the most innovative. Uh, and I'll try to remain polite. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the, the need for them uh, to innovate is very low. Now, interestingly, we have helped or we are helping a, a manufacturer of water filters build a partnership with a water utility in the Philippines, uh, leverage, exactly leveraging the same model. And it's working well. So... I think it's really because ideas do not permeate, uh, because uh, uh, the, and the need to innovate is not huge. But when you propose this idea to someone, they seem to, to take it. Mm. Okay, so that's a bit like your scaling through corporate, scaling through a public utility can have that, that reach. It's more replicating than scaling, right? It's, it's finding... Instead of going through an MFI with all the problems this implies, if you work with a water utility or even better, an electric utility, you would get 5 million households at once that you can invoice, that you can market to, that uh, you can choose. So it, it, it's an accelerator of the, pro, of the replication model, which is, which is great. But uh, yes, uh, th this particular case has always been, because on top of that, this particular utility was part of a broader group 
that was present in many countries. And so you really scratch your head and say, why the hell are they seeing it? But the bottom line is that they didn't need to. I mean, for, for companies to do something different, innovative, a bit risky, they need to, to feel the pressure of doing so. When they can afford to do nothing, they do like most of us. Yeah. Great, thank you. A final question to you both. Um, I'm not going to ask you for your top tips or top recommendations of what to do to get to scale. You've, you've described those really well. What are the top two main things you would say don't do? Avoid that if you really want to get your, your model to scale. Top two things not to do? Yeah. Well, I mean, that's just uh, that's flipping a positive into a negative. Um, it is, but I think I, it's a you know, I mean, I, I will say don't let the challenges stop you from doing this. Um, I think that this is something extraordinarily exciting and important. And while, you know, Olivier and I talk about the difficulties and, and things in doing it, and it may seem a little daunting from time to time, it's because of the energy and interest. And if you can do this, and, and there's always an if, but if you can do it, you can do something really substantial. Um, and I think that, is is absolutely crucial you know do it right so that's the positive right the negative is don't stop thinking about doing it um and then uh, you know building off things that olivia and i have said is you know also you know i think I, olivia used this term and I'll, I'll steal it if you don't mind but you know we think the same way which is don't put yourself in the center you know this isn't about you being a hero it's about you being a leader so don't go into this thinking that i'm going to be a hero and save the world Think of this as I'm going to try and do something interesting that's going to have to involve engaging a lot of people on a long journey. And the goal isn't to you know, have a great story to, that you served a thousand people. That's, that's wonderful. But that's not really the impact we need. It's, it's on a journey to serve millions. And be prepared to be on a journey and be prepared to be part of something, not the center of something. And have fun. This is great. I mean, this is, again, if you can do it, wow. You know, we're, we're at the cusp of something really very exciting. And we're, I think Olivia and I and, and Carolyn all think we want, it's time to move up that inflection point. Time to, you know, take that hockey stick and really turn it up. But there are things we have to do to, to make that more possible. Thanks, Ted, well, Olivia. You, you stole one of the two I had. So uh, I, the, the one, one is don't have don't be arrogant enough to think the problem was not solved and have the humility as a result to look for what already exists and do your homework basically right uh, that i think would be number one and maybe the one before the number one would be don't ask for permission from anyone uh, that i've seen I had discussions with CEOs that were quite, uh, I would say, uh, very uh, emotional because they, you had some people who had said, you know, as long as I run this company, this is the way, this is what we will do. Uh, now, you shareholders, uh, whether or not you think this is in your long-term interest, this is your problem. This is not my problem. You, you can fire me. Uh, every day of the week, weekends included. So as long as I'm not fired, I'll consider you are supporting me on this. But as long as I run this company, this is what I will do. And I think the thing you shouldn't do is blame the system uh, for not doing things. Because your boss tells you that this is not within budget or that shareholders are short-term oriented. I think that the, the people who are thinking that way end up incredibly frustrated. Instead, I think you, you can push, as a friend of mine from Danon, who is, I think, a great company in this sense, uh, says, you know, you only know where the ceiling is when you hit your head against it. So as long as you don't hear bang, this is okay. You can continue. Great. Thank you. Well, to all our participants, um, thank you for your questions. I hope we tackled most of them. Uh, we've had several questions about follow-up information. 
you will be getting a couple of emails from us, one very shortly today, one once everything is loaded up uh, on YouTube and the resources are loaded on the Practitioner Hub. Um, and uh, I know you would like the panelists' emails as soon as we've confirmed that with them. I'm sure that will be included. And oh. really thank you for participating. Our next webinar will be in January uh, on nutrition and selling marketing nutritious products at the base of the pyramid and getting consumer insights. So very similar themes about how do we learn from consumers and uh, how do we really engage. And to, to Ted London and Olivier Cater, I want to thank you so much for drawing out your insights and being willing to share them um, in writing in your book and in a candid way on our conversation now. So, but thank you both very much indeed. Thanks to you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye everybody. Bye bye.